if I go from one end of the spectrum, uh, I certainly supported Elizabeth May in, I think, 2006, uh, Jack Layton in the NDP 2004, again in 2008, even 2011, but by then it was clear he wasn't going to get anything done. We went backwards there. I supported the Liberals uh, in the last election. Uh, I don't often do that. Um, and I joined the Conservative Party to vote for Maxime Bernier for the leadership of that. And now I'm a, uh, a member of the People's Party because uh, I love Max. I think he's the best. I like Max politician. too, man. <laughs> Just, uh, I don't know. Great. There's he's so actually, many reasons you can say, I, I hey, relate, he's... I relate to him on every level, even though he never talks about cannabis. You know, I know how he feels, but it's kind of a landmine to walk in the cannabis field, um, especially since it's really not something a lot of the members of the People's Party really get. They're mostly free marketeers, though, so there's a good core there. And I'm hoping they get 5 to 7% and Max gets reelected in his home riding of Bose. I can't see them making dents anywhere else because the Trudeau has helped damage his own popularity. I don't believe Canadians are going to vote for someone who has a turban on. I'm sorry, they won't. Um, maybe that's my inherent racism or something, but uh, I'm suspicious of Indian politics. I lived in India for a year. I'm suspicious of Sikh politics. Um, and I don't think he relates to the Canadian ordinary person. His slick suits, his lawyer background, his Sikh background, to me, it's not something I can relate to, and I'm not. I, I don't think Canadians are going to relate to it, and I think the NDP is going to do a, a record bad, res, get a bad response. And uh, considering the Liberal are in trouble now, that greatly favors the Conservative because Andrew Scheer is as bland and uninspiring and as as the same as every other politician you've ever heard, including Singh and Trudeau and Harper, all rolled into one obsequious, you know. Yeah kind of bilious, annoying thing. We're lacking. But he's going to win. He's going to win. Maybe only yeah. a minority, though. Mm. So we'll see what that produces. Well, and I'm glad you said that, too. There's something to be said about minority governments. And did you ever get behind the proportional representation movement for uh, uh, Fair Vote Canada or anything like that? Generally, I, I'm, I'm like most libertarian anarchistic types, is that I don't even believe in voting as a concept. I don't believe my vote, or rather my life, should be voted on. And so all these people voting for this representative every four years and giving them carte blanche to impose all these horrible laws on me, uh, it goes against my nature. But I also want to engage in our political system because we don't have any alternatives. So when you say, do I favor proportional representation? Yeah, if everybody who got over 2% was represented, I'd find that fair because then libertarians would get elected enough to have some representatives and pot people probably as well. I think pot people could get together 2% because we have an abomination in the Cannabis Act. So I would suspect most Canadians who smoke cannabis are very unhappy with the regime we've got. And if 2% was the threshold, then uh, that would be worthwhile for libertarians, for cannabis people. Hell, you could get a whole bunch of fringe parties with representation. And then we'd really see some fun, right? Because you'd still get those mainstream parties with their 20 25%. But you probably have ten smaller parties between two and five percent, and that would be so much fun. Mm. You know, we'd have to expand the parliament to about four hundred and fifty seats from its three hundred and twenty-four or three hundred and thirty-two. Yeah, representation certainly would be better. And uh, the minor well, well, you're going to need you're going to need half and half though. The pre pre first mm. past the post got to be directly representing. A region, yeah, and maybe. then there's going to be the party list. Maybe. You can't let the party list dominate all the parliament. These are people who are indirectly elected. Like, you know, like if I vote for the marijuana party and the top four people get in because we got three or four percent of the vote, that's pretty indirect democracy handing power there. So there should always be at least half the members directly first past the post, and then the other half are proportional yeah. representatives. There's different styles of it, too. Yeah, like so that everybody who gets over 2% is represented, but you're still going to need that direct accountability. Gotcha. What do you got coming up? Uh, you're talking about, uh, you're in Toronto now, right? Yeah, well, I was traveling for seven months since last August, and I was here for in Toronto for four months. I'm here during the baseball season. How long have you been out? When did you when did you land in North and uh, in Canada again? I got out on April fourteenth, twenty fourteen, from that five year stint oh, in the U.S. for selling seeds years. to Americans. Wow. By May, you know, 
started out as 28 to 40 years, so I was just grateful to get five. What were the um, politics the behind that extradition? It was, I, I, I mean, I don't get enraged about many things, about but... What I, was doing. I did sell three million seeds to Americans. I was using that money to subvert their democracy, so <coughs> I'll explain. Hmm. I was spending that money like nobody's business when I got it. That's... Um, that's my brother there. <laughs> and uh, I was spending it. So I financed uh, the 1998 Washington, D.C. Medical Marijuana Initiative, the Colorado 2000 Initiative, the Arizona 2002 Initiative. I threw money at the Alaska Initiatives three uh, years in a row, 2002, 2000, 2004. And, and I was just I was taking the U.S. federal government to court in Philadelphia in a class action suit. So I'm spending millions of dollars. Um, fighting what, in whatever way is possible. Like, for example, a Canadian guy like me paying for a, a ballot initiative in Colorado is quite amusing. First of all, it's not legal. I'm not allowed to spend money on U.S. elections. But it was really easy just to give my friends 10000 here, 10000 there, and end up paying for the whole thing, or a good chunk of it, um, because you had to go, you, we paid people to go get signatures. You pay them about a dollar a signature in those days. It's probably more now. <clears throat> But it's still the way it's done. So we paid for the signatures to get it on the ballot, and then they, we won. And that's in 2000. That's the medical one. So I was having all sorts of fun, sponsoring initiatives everywhere, rallies, marches, class action suits against the U.S. federal government. And I would boast about it as a way of getting people to buy my seeds. I would say, see, when you send me money for these seeds, not only do you get great seeds, but I'm going to fuck shit up in the United States with your money. And so it worked great. I gave, I gave over $5, 5 million dollars from 1995 to 2005. But and so the DEA was watching this, and so I was giving them a lot of incentive to come after me. But how much money they spent, and 32 different U.S. Canadian organizations were involved, including Homeland Security, DEA, FBI. Internal Revenue Service, the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, the, it just goes on and on. It's staggering how many people were involved and prosecutors. They bought seeds from me, for example, in every one of the United States they ordered by mail. And when DEA makes a buy, they're not small buys. They're big buys. When the agent, Agent Menendez, um, came and bought them from me in person, Seriously? they were like $3,000 at a time, which is a big sale. And that guarantees that you're not going to get cold feet once they start dangling this huge amount of money. Because I was used to big purchasers, right? They were still, like, nice to get, 3000 bucks. I didn't see many people come up with 3000 bucks, And she didn't come just once. She came over a year and bought it for me four times, these kind of huge quantities, right? So they've got some serious money going on when they, when they get you. Unbelievable. Well, the investigation was uh, two years and ten months long. And it started three days after I humiliated uh, the drug czar, John Walters, when he came to visit Vancouver in November 2002. So you bet there was a lot of political motivation. That was a highly motivated uh, extradition and arrest. <laughs> I humiliated them. I was embarrassing them. And I was boasting about it. And people like that, they, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was thinking more of it. I know that uh, certainly the American politics of it, but uh, the Canadian politics, what got me, I said, we're really sending this it, guy down to the States. He got 3,000 letters, exactly 3,001 letters opposing my extradition and only seven in favor. And they still extradited me. I'm, a, I'm It's pretty beautiful. They got 3,000 handwritten letters against it. And that had no influence on them, which just goes to show you the government doesn't really give a fuck about your opinion once they're in power. No matter who they are, they do what they want to do, and they have political reasons for doing that. And it won't matter what heck, it won't even matter what your own party wants. For the prime minister, he wants to make sure uh, S and C Lavalin isn't prosecuted, and that's his, you know, ultimate desire, right? So, you know, if he wants to make it happen, it happens. But if he doesn't, you know, then you're in big trouble. So, you know, I was. I was embarrassing the U.S. government, embarrassing the Canadian government, boasting about all these things. So, you know, you know, I have no bad things to say about my prison experience. It was very, very wonderful in so many ways. I have nothing but fond memories of all my prisons that I've been into. I can tell you every one of them, where I was, how long, and 
for me, there was so much redemptive. I read 140 books in that five years. I learned to play bass guitar. I was in a rock and roll band for three years. I practiced on a musical instrument two, three hours a day. I couldn't believe I'm playing note for note versions of songs that I've grown up all my life loving, like you know, Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix. I knew seven of his songs, three Stevie Ray Vaughan songs. I knew how to play Come Together by the Beatles, Jumpin' Jack Flash, you know, Bob Marley songs, Otis Redding songs, Nirvana. I could play Come As You Are and Smells Like Teen Spirit. I mean, I couldn't believe I was doing this, right? That it was, and, you know, I enjoyed the quiet time. I wrote the best stuff I've ever written in my life in prison. Wow. Uh, typically, that's not uncommon. You can write some good quality material there because um, you get quality thinking time. In the real world, you don't get much quality thinking time. You know, there's this distraction of our screens here. Um, there's drugs. There's sex. There's pornography. There's the boredom of marriage. Um, there's going to work. There's children. There's things. Always there's something to distract you. You really just don't get hour after hour of quality thinking time where you could meditate or you could write or you could think. And I really enjoyed that opportunity. But as many of the inmates will tell you wherever I was, I made the prison kind of like my office. I could make things happen in a way no one else could because I had people on the outside that could make phone calls happen or books arrive or, you know, whatever somebody needed. Like a, hard to believe that in a prison – there's going to be guys who don't have their own Bible, but a couple of guys doing life came to me one day and said, I don't have a Bible. And they make a nice one that you can get your name in it. And I thought, oh, I'll absolutely get you this Bible. Um, and, and actually, I probably got several Bibles, actually, for people. There, there's some better than normal Bibles out there um, insofar as, you know, if you're going to be a lifer. One out of every eight guys I was with, there would typically be about 150 to 160 guys in my unit. And uh, at least 25 to 30 are doing life without parole. So uh, you never, I try never to say no to those guys if they needed a favor. Because I couldn't imagine life without parole. Wow. Those, and Bibles being hard <laughs> to get in prison doesn't seem like, uh, you'd think of anything else, they'd be encouraging that. But Well, the, the religious people all get together. Like the Muslims are all together, the Christians, there's various kinds of Christians. Um, there's, your religious people are going to be there. Um, but that doesn't mean anybody's paying for your own in, you know, personal Bible wow. or like that. You can get a cheap one because oh, okay. yeah. books are abused, right? Mm. Um, but, you know, mm. there are some nice Bibles out there, so I, I would get those for occasion. I got a good story, though, about guys with getting life without parole. Life without parole. Okay, um, it's almost all black guys, and it's almost all for crack cocaine. <laughs> you'd be surprised. <laughs> no, maybe you wouldn't be. But you'd be surprised <laughs> how many guys were doing life for relatively small amounts of drugs. And for that matter, in five years, I never met what you'd call a kingpin. If I, there was one, he would have been introduced to me. But I never met any kingpins. I always met just the low-level drug mules, and they end up getting, like, life without parole. There's this one guy, Nate Carter. And he's, uh, at first, he really annoyed me when I got to that prison because he had a voice, a loud, scratchy voice, and he was very animated during any American football game and any American basketball game. He was a big fan of LeBron James. And prisons usually divided between LeBron haters and LeBron fans. And they loved going at it with each other, razzing each other. And they razzed each other fairly loud. And because blacks constitute a clear majority in any prison, you're not going to argue with them. And it's anyway, at first I'm thinking, that guy is really loud. And then my cellmate said, yeah, but he's a really good guy, actually, when you get to know him. And besides, he's doing life without parole. So are you going to go tell him? And that's when I learned you don't ever tell people who are doing life without parole to shut up or be quiet or anything because they could go crazy and they have nothing to lose. As it turns out, most of them are incredibly civil guys, considering from my perspective, they have nothing to lose. Anyway, <clears throat> over the years that go, goes by, and uh, one day I used to get all the legal news because I used to be the jailhouse lawyer in a lot of places. And I got a note from someone who said, Mark, the Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, is going to kick guys out, is what he says, who are doing long, nonviolent terms um, over 10 years, uh, sorry, over 20 years, who have served over 10 years. So one day I say to Nate, hey, the Attorney General's got something new. Nate, how long have you been here? He says, 18 years. I said, what's the year since his life without parole, right? He says, yeah. I said, well, listen, do you have any violence in your past at all? And he goes, no, nothing. So I said, well, Nate, you should fill this forms out and send them in. He says, no, I do it every year. Nothing ever happens. I'm not doing it. I said, you really should do it, Nate, because this is meant for you. I'm sure before, yes, with Clinton and Bush, it was useless. 
But Obama might really be serious. Anyway, weeks go by, I badger him every day. And then finally one day he says, okay, if you help me, I'll do it. But he says, but I've done it before and nothing's going to happen. So sure enough, anyway, we fill it out. And that's where I learn all about him. I go, Nate, have you ever had any violent infractions in the prison? That's important too. And he goes, no, I've never even had an infraction. I said, Nate, I have had three infractions and I'm, you know, I'm a normal human being in this prison and I have three infractions. How can you have been here 18 years and not even have a slight infraction? He says, well, I don't. I said, well, that's going to look really good. So we write all this down. We send it to the government and I get released. Huzzah. And I come home and I forget all about Nate Carter unfortunately, uh, until two years later, in, July, in May 2016, he calls me and says, Mark, I just got a letter from the president. I'm going to get out in July with no strings attached. I got that executive clemency. And he goes, Mark, you made me do it. Thank you so much. And God bless you. And every three weeks, he calls me up wherever I am in the world. And he says, Mark, where are you? And I say where I am, which the last time was actually, I think, Barcelona. And he says, well, Mark, I love life. I love my family. I love freedom. God bless you. Thanks for everything. And he always asks how Jody is, too, because he used to see Jody come and visit me. Whenever he had a visit, Jody would be there with me. And so he always got used to seeing her, and everybody kind of got used to Jody because she came to see me 81 times, which is another amazing story. Because 81 visits to me, 14 hours it took her to go from Vancouver to either Georgia, southeast Georgia, like as far away as you, or Mississippi, 14 hours to get there, and another 14 hours on the Monday to go back. So she visited me 81 times. That's 162 days in travel, five and a half months of her life, and 162 days sitting beside me for five hours, and that's five and a half hours, or five and a half months of her life there, too. So 11 months of her whole life was either traveling to see me or sitting beside me during that five years. So I'm really lucky about that. Anyway, Nate always calls me up every three weeks. And that's the, the best thing that I ever did in all the time I was in prison. I'm really pleased about a lot of things I did. I was a lawyer for a lot of people, and I didn't need to charge anybody anything because I was well supported by my wife and what have you. So the guys in the prison tended to be real nice to me everywhere. And that's my best story. Nate Carter is out because I badgered him into sending uh, for an executive clemency to President Obama, and he got it. And he's also got a letter from the president, which I don't have. So he's good for him. He's got an autograph letter from President Obama. And he's out of prison and he calls me up and it makes me feel really good when he calls me. What's up? Uh, you, you can do a lot in prison. Wow. You know, yeah. like a lot of satisfying things. I've got dozens of stories of being able to help people do stuff or just plain strange things that happen to you in prison that kind of teach you a lesson. How old are you now, Mark? 61. 61. And so what are you working on? What's the, what's the future look like for Mark Emery now? <laughs> well, I'm actually in a state of flux. I've been traveling for seven months and I used up a lot of money. So now I have to start thinking about what I'm going to do for work or what I'm going to work for, or what I'm going to do. Cannabis I culture? Can't... What? You sold out well, of that? Or? It's, you know, Jody owns that. Oh, place. okay. Jody runs right. it. Okay. So I, I gave it to her for a dollar in 2000. I did think I would get it back. <laughs> we had quite a bit of arguments about that for a while. But ultimately, she prevailed because she said, well, Mark, I've been doing this for five years, and now you come back. I don't know if I can be your sidekick anymore. I've been running everything for five years. Being your sidekick isn't very appealing. She said, you could just travel around the world. Everybody loves you. <laughs> travel doesn't appeal to Jody the same way because uh, for her, it's just not that pleasant. Mm. Um, <clears throat> she's an introvert. I'm an extrovert, so she's correct. I love traveling. I love meeting people. Everybody is great to me everywhere I go. Whenever people ask me, is the place safe or are people friendly, I say, they're all safe and they're all friendly. That's my experience. As soon as somebody mugs me, I'll tell you that place is not safe and not friendly. But otherwise, you know, everywhere I go, travel is a beautiful thing. And I'm having trouble decompressing because life is so boring here. I mean, I've been doing all my tasks and stuff. I had a lot to do when I got back, but it's like done in five days now. I've got dental work on Friday, which is why I'm back in Canada at all. I'm supposed to be in Greece right now, Santorini. Um, and that is a lot more appealing than the gray Toronto April that is going on here. Oh, my goodness. What do you and got there in many pretty buildings in Canada. Uh. Like I've been to Europe, Spain and France and South Africa and Morocco and all the major capitals of South America, you know, Mexico. There's just not a lot of beauty in Toronto. It's nice. I like living here, but it's just not a beautiful place. 
So I guess uh, it's fair to say. So you remember the PPC then? So I hate to bring it back to politics all the time, oh, but I'm just sure. fascinated by you know your. Max is great. I hope he gets a lot of support. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I like the guy a lot. He, to me, he resonates. He's so sincere. He's right on the money. Stop pandering. And so we need a politician who doesn't pander. Well, and this is it. I mean, I was talking to a buddy of mine, Greg Vesna. I don't know if you know the name, but he's I been do. around a long time, and he's Monia business, early days There's of the Green Party. There's a trophy named after him. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, and, and just, you know, we're hopeful people, and we get sucked in. We drank the Kool-Aid on Justin. I really, we were oh, so boy. glad to get hey, rid of Harper. He got a lot of votes from us. He's going to miss them. Yeah. We're, well, we, got, we were so damn uh, ready to get rid of Harper that – and uh, we did great under Harper. That's the problem. We, things yeah. got really good with Harper. Mm. We all started opening shops up and breaking the law and getting away with it. And, but him and I were talking the other day. He's like, Jimmy, I helped him get elected as leader. Why are you, are you like, <laughs> we all drunk the Kool Aid because <laughs> not as influential as uh, some of us. But uh, so are, are you going to, are you going to do anything for the party? Do you think other than no, just support I, I, I'll give him the maximum amount and yeah. I will help out on any campaign. Um, but he probably doesn't need a guy as controversial and notorious as I am. I don't think Max is afraid of controversy at all. That's what I like about him. He just says it. <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot true, that but, needs to be but, said right now. How, how did, sorry to cut you off, Mark. You don't want candidates who necessarily distract from the leader's message. Hmm. See, Max's message is really good. So yeah. high profile candidates are desirable. Yes. If they let people focus on the message. Um, mm. And to some degree, now here's the thing I like, Phil. In uh, the riding of Burnaby South, where the uh, by election was held, right, the People's Party candidate did like 11% mm -hmm. and only did like 3 to 4% in the other ridings, the other three ridings in the by election, right? So they did really great in Burnaby. But during that campaign, the conservative guy said, if Mark Emery's endorsing Maxim Bernio, the Prince of Pot, wants to legalize pot, and he thinks Max is great. <laughs> and quoted me and put this all around town on these posters. And, it, you know, and then the People's Party candidate got all indignant about it and raised a fuss. But the fact is, she did three times better than any other riding. So I'm going to take a little bit of credit for that. There you go. And that some of my people saw that and said, well, Mark, yeah. that's Max and Bernie. I got to get out and vote for him. How does Mark Emery get away these days with uh, the political correctness culture? Well, you don't. I've been publicly shamed over something uh, as trivial that happened 10, 15 years ago and that I, I contest is completely distorted because people today can re resent or regret activities they, they embraced 10, 15 years ago when they have a change in personal philosophy. Amen. They can, they can <laughs> change the way they look at the same event. Hmm. I'll give you an extreme. I mean, example. that can happen on a daily basis, went, but yeah, I, went, I get what you're saying. I went, you know, I went to an orgy once in 2000, yeah, November 2000, and I took some women with me. If you ask those women today what they think about going to that orgy, their response is going to be different than what they thought at the time. <laughs> right? My response might even be different, right? Because we, we look at things differently over time. And other people discover Christ. They discover religion. When women have babies, they get very conservative, right? So whereas they were a wild, wild, uh, hard oh, living, God. fast living times before a baby, once the baby's born, they go through a kind of a conservative transformation. And protection. Um, this is, this yeah, is everything changes. Though, you need to protect the baby. It's a highly sought after uh, electorate ideal because these are typically conservative people who have children um, who show up to vote because they have a vested interest. So... All these things, and then we have the identity politics that's practiced today on the campuses and coming from our academia. And everybody in, in this kind of post-Marxist world is looked at as either someone with power or someone who doesn't have power, someone who oppresses or someone who is oppressed. In other words, every relationship breaks down into uh, male-female, black-white, rich-poor, um, working class, you know, white. And it's no, there's no end to that kind of division. And so as long as you think like that, we're, that, that's a doomed philosophy. I just like to think that everybody overall in Canada gets a fair shake at, at what we have to offer as a nation and as a culture. 
And compared to 93% of women, for example, in Egypt who go through female genital mutilation or all the poverty I've seen around the world, um, all the exclusion, um, when you look at Latin America and you look at Africa and you look at Southern Europe and you look at Asia, I think the status of women, for example, and gay people is superior in Canada to almost anywhere when it comes to freedoms, liberties, protections, mm. uh, safeties, health. Uh, all those outcomes are much more favorable here than anywhere else in the world. So I'm, uh, you've got to be careful about the people who hate this country that want to cause division, right? I, but, you know, I heard these extreme things, too. When I was in prison in the USA, they would go, Mark, Harper is so awful. He's changed everything. And you won't even recognize the country. I came back. It looked just the same. <laughs> it sounded the same. And then they voted Harper out a year later. Now nobody talks about, oh, Harper permanently changed the landscape or Harper made the country unrecognizable. It's not unrecognizable. Just like I hear the same thing now from the conservatives whining about Justin Trudeau. Oh, he's ruining the country. He's wrecking. It's not wrecked. It's not ruined. It takes more than a politician to ruin this country, for God's sake. Um, and, and they do lots of damage. But Canada is, is much too big for one person, even over a generation, to really adversely affect. Canada's made up of Canadians. The politicians are really just at the back of the flock trying to follow the people ahead and, and try to get ahead of the, the, mm. the popular wave. But right. yeah. all the politicians so don't, don't change the – I don't think they change the nature of this country. I think the people do. And that's why I'm worried about what goes on in academia because this is where all our young people are learning all their you know, philosophy from. Mm. And yeah, when you said a mouthful there, and I was, just before we went live, I was kind of venting my frustration uh, of the, the 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 political shift that I've had. I mean, I've I've run in ten. Well, you turned right wing, like so many people, appalled with the left. Well, I am very concerned with my freedom of speech and yours, and yeah. and everyone else, and every idiot, well, and you're every free to say anything as long as it doesn't trigger any one of a hundred different intersectional groups who are. Easily offended, and, and uh, you know your microaggressions are making life unsafe for them. In fact, your words are violence if you listen to them. And preach, know, Mark Emery, preach, man! That's, that's how. Yeah, here's the thing, though. That's why <laughs> freedom of speech really is in danger, and why young people embrace socialism and don't really care much about freedom of speech. Mm. Um, you know, it's funny too. I, I was thinking, what a marvel technology is, what it, what it can do for us. I'll give you the great thing about it. And this device here, I pay $10.77 every month, and I have access to 76 million recorded songs. In fact, the entire pantheon of recorded music is available for $10.99 every month. When I, when I was a kid, for $10, you got 10 songs on vinyl that would deteriorate over time, and that $10 was worth like $100 today. Right. So my, my one record purchase would probably buy the equivalent of one year of Google Play and it's 76 million. dollars. Now, here's what I want to know. Anybody that has access to every song ever recorded for ten dollars a month has no right to complain about shit. <laughs> Nothing. You spoiled and grateful child. You should be kissing an Preach, image of Steve Jobs Mark every day Emery, and my Sergey Brin for Prime every Minister, day. man. Every song. This ever is so true, man. As often as you like for ten dollars a month. This is becoming the narrative. I think uh, Ben uh, Ben Shapiro, you're going to complain about living in the best time. That oh, we've sure. ever been in. Hey, There's no one terrible. starving in North America. Well, I'm, very few people are starving in North America, and the poor have iPhones. So, well, yeah, and, you, and what you're complaining about and gender pronouns? I, I got a toothache in Paris that within 48 hours became a rampant infection, which 85 years ago would have killed me because mm. we didn't invent antibiotics and it didn't become commonly until 1945. So little and, gratitude. So, yeah, so I'm thinking. Gee, I would have to have my whole mouth operated on. Mm -hmm. I might have died. I would have lost a lot mm -hmm. of my face because I had an infection I can't do anything about. But like I said, it cost me like $10 in antibiotics. And now I'm cured getting dental surgery later on this week. That'll cost me. But the point is, is that we live in an age of miracles. And Ages of miracles. Can you imagine when, my, when I was born, we didn't even have socialized medicine, if you think that's a good thing. And so... Healthcare has gotten so much better for people. They have so many more options. You can read about everything now. You can find out about your own health choices better than you ever could before. You have access to herbs and pills and whatever kind of doctor you want, right? If you 
if you're thinking, if you're sentient, if you're embracing this world, there's unbelievable treasures every day, everywhere. Mm. So the idea, too, that we need to find hate, we need to find division, we need to encourage comparatives. Whenever you compare yourself with someone else, you're going to lose because mm. half the world is better off and half the world is not better off than you are. And half the world is probably more talented than you are and half the world isn't. You know, and there's a whole bunch of advantages. We all have advantages and disadvantages when we compare, which is why it's fruitless to do so. Mm. We should all be grateful we're alive and whatever we've got, we're lucky to have. And let's hope for the best in staying healthy and living a long, prosperous life. That should be about it. Mm. Uh, I consider you a forward thinker. I hope you're not flattered too much by that. But uh, and, and just well, talking about be fruit either, too. Uh, and just um, you know, a couple things you said there as far as you know, the ra sometimes, well, a lot of the times. Uh, things like simple things like penicillin or insulin come from the radical extremes, right? And we look at these people like they're like they're actually witchcraft in right? a practicing. I mean, you look at history, well, and some of the easy. solutions that we adopted uh, come from the radical extremes. What do you, if you were to forecast out, what do you think you could say that something that feels extreme now that might be common practice in no time? Anything? Well, I think all technology feels extreme, like the iPhone was pretty amazing then, it's pretty amazing now, but I know when uh, they discovered penicillin, in what is it, Fleming, uh, discovered penicillin by mold on bread applied to a bacteria, diminished the bacteria. Yeah, That's they wanted to trippy, have them committed, didn't they? It's a trippy kind of thing, you know, what if you got all this bread mold, it's like somebody's thinking the guy's a bachelor who just won't clean the fuck up, and then next thing you know... He's saving millions of people around the world, right? By the way, there's a great book about that, too, called uh, A Brilliant Radiance, about how penicillin was discovered and what a group effort it was mm. and how when we really want to mobilize our resources, we can do incredible things in a short period of time. Um, because that went from uh, the discovery of its, uh, its practical application in 1938, 39, to it being available to every human uh, in North America for two cents a dose um, by 1945, you know, so we went from you were going to die if you got a lot of these infections in 1939 to you're going to live for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, that's incredible stuff that we have put behind us. You know, it, it bothers me when I see people don't like vaccinations. <coughs> I mean, I wish I had a chink chicken pox vaccination when I was a kid. It wasn't around then. Um, so I'm not at any risk of getting shingles. It would be nice if I were vaccinated for that. In my day, of course, they made us all get it together. <laughs> so I got measles, German measles, red measles, chicken pox, mumps, you name it. I've had all of those things, right? And generally that was good because I don't know anybody who had complications when I was a kid from any of that stuff. Um, but it's possible, I suppose. Mm. And everybody being vaccinated uh, would probably be a